<clears throat> Hello. Hello, ladies. Are you there? Marion, I got there. Hello. Um, good afternoon, I guess. The time is here. Uh, we should start, but I'm not getting a trigger from the moderation team. Um, can any one of the participants let me know if you can hear me? Because I have uh, a whole list of people that have come online to join in all there should be 160 or more the thing is i <clears throat> cannot see whether or not good so i guess then we'll start welcome um uh to this uh, session we have until 14 20 uh 50 minutes uh to discuss apis as drivers for innovative business models i have the chat open my name is adam von Speiker. i have the chat open i can see the stuff that's coming in that you're sending me um the interesting thing is that with 160 people if you all start to chat um 
then uh, obviously I um, uh, will not be able to um, <clears throat> will not be able to respond to each and every one of you, but I'll try to pick out. And uh, thankfully, we have Agatha and uh, Marion to uh, moderate and uh, let me know if there are any questions. Um, so I would like to start this uh, session. Um, the good news is that we have 50 minutes to discuss APIs as drivers for innovative business models. The bad news is that uh, with 160 people in the group, it's going to be a little bit less of a workshop, an active workshop, uh, because there are simply are so many people that we can't do some of the exercises together that we had planned. Uh, but I thank you all for joining, because I'm, I'm really thrilled to have um, such an audience. <clears throat> um, uh, I see that there are still people, although I have started and we are on time, I still see that there are people entering the session. So I'm going to give it one or a few more minutes. Uh, in the meantime, I can introduce myself uh, perhaps a little bit more. Um, my... All sorts of things are happening on my screen. <clears throat> Uh, Agatha, can you let me know if it is safe for me to start? Because I'm not quite sure. I have a whole lot of people in the session when I'm browsing through. It, it's well over 150. But Agatha, if you can let me know whether I can start. Good. <clears throat> As always, Agatha, Agatha has the last word, which means we can go ahead and start. Um, thanks for joining all of you. Um, it's a bit of a messy start, but uh, I hope you apologize. You'll accept my apologies for that. My name is Adam von Speiker. I have been um, uh, working for Blinklane Consulting and Gladwell Academy, two sister companies, for the last seven years. Um, and basically, uh, Blinklane Consulting and Gladwell Academy help organizations to become more nimble and more adaptive to change. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, what I do at the company is Gladwell Academy is the training company uh, where Blinklane Consulting is the consulting firm. The two merged together is the Blinklane Group. Uh, Blinklane Consulting is one of the leading institutes <clears throat> in, um, at least in, in Europe, on implementing large-scale uh, agile ways of working in organizations and a process called continuous innovation. And Gladwell Academy is one of the most renowned training institutes on corporate agility, uh, agile for hardware, and uh, continuous innovation. Um, I'm the author of two books. The, my first book was published in 2014. It's called The New Oil, which uh, has as a subtitle, Using Innovative Business Models to Turn Data into Profit. And it was one of the first books in the market that uh, discussed how to use data as a product or service in your company um, uh, and actually as a business model. And it relied very heavily on the development of APIs. And the second book that I published was uh, last year, early this year, called Continuous Innovation. It is about how corporate organizations can have a continuous process of innovation or how they should have a continuous process of innovation to help them stay relevant in today's fast-changing market. And again, in that book, <clears throat> APIs and the, the disclosure of digital um, information throughout your organization and to third parties is a big driver for innovation. I am also the founder of the Continuous Innovation Framework. And the Continuous Innovation Framework is a blueprint organizational model for managing continuous innovation, making sure that in your organization, there is a constant effort to renew and to invent and to reinvent what you already have. Because in today's fast-paced market, you need organizations that can continuously introduce new products and services. So I'm gonna start off with an example, explain to you with an example case of my work, then I'm going to explain to you what continuous innovation as a concept is, what the continuous innovation framework is, and how APIs are ex extremely important in driving that type of innovation. And how 
there is a need for APIs that are simpler, smaller, nimbler on the inside of your organization to facilitate innovation and how APIs are a driving force behind. <clears throat> feel free to use the chat. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, uh, ask anything. Um, I will also share an email address later on at the end of the presentation uh, where you can ask questions and a link to um, the LinkedIn group uh, for the continuous innovation framework so that you can become a member of the LinkedIn community uh, or sorry of the of the uh, continuous innovation community uh, and, and drop your questions there because I'll be um, uh, listening to that very frequently. So let's first start off. Imagine a world, and this is a world that was already a few years ago a reality uh, and to which I uh, contributed uh, to some extent, although not for the New York Times. But imagine a world where your newspaper is not an average newspaper as designed by somebody else, but that your newspaper would sort of adjust to your personal preferences. Nowadays, we don't think that that is a very thrilling exercise anymore. <clears throat> because we understand that by reading an online newspaper, and you as an audience would know that like no others, that reading an online newspaper would leave a trail of information about me, a trail of data to the news publish, newspaper publisher on who I am, what my preferences are. And it would allow the newspaper publisher to tailor make a website into a personalized homepage in this case, with video items on the left side, with more relevant information about the sports that I like or the geographical areas that I would be interested in. And imagine a world in which I could read a newspaper that was tailor-made to my own likings. Now, like I said, that's not a very shocking issue, but it's, it's, it was a very neat trick that we could do by the time we invented this a couple of years ago. <clears throat> Uh, and by the time I did this for a particular newspaper company in, in the Netherlands, um, it was 2015, and this newspaper was really, really dedicated to give a personalized homepage to the audience. Uh, and we had serious debates about what would constitute my personal preferences and how that would be set apart from news. So the first thing we did is we said, there is only an editorial board that can decide what news is, but there is a whole area in the newspaper that is free to manipulate and tailor make to my personal preferences. So the section about sports, the section about what videos to view, the section about what non-primary uh, news would be, whether I'd be interested in finance or in sports or in lifestyle over uh, one or the other. <clears throat> and we could tailor make the newspaper. Um, but then we went into spending uh, or showing relevant ads. And then we got into this interesting discussion where we said, okay, let's not in the newspaper business try to bombard our readers with more annoying ads, with more advertising that people didn't ask for, even though it is our primary business model. Let's move to a world where we can have no more annoying ads. Let's try if we can use the personal profiling for this particular newspaper uh, to be so good that we could show ads of which the customers would say that the ads are part of the content of the organization. So they would read the newspaper because of the news and they would appreciate the ads because they were relevant to the people's needs. That was the aim or that was the objective that we set. And <clears throat> as a starting point for this presentation about APIs, it was important because the only thing that could make us do that was to get more relevant information about the people reading the newspaper and what they thought were relevant ads, but also to get more information from advertisers on how particular ads, given my personal relevance, would be connected to their to the ecosystem of the newspaper. So that is a context that I wanted to start. And we did this for a large part in the organization uh, only because not only did we start a program in the newspaper for getting newspapers to be personalized, but also by reshaping the data landscape, completely reshaping the data landscape and making it an API built landscape or an API based landscape uh, first and foremost. So this example I'll be touching upon in the rest of the presentation later on. Now imagine a second example. Um, 
it's the company, the company that I'm going to discuss is the company called 3M. And we all know 3M from sticky notes. And if you're in any form of development, you're probably in agile working, which means that only 24 hours ago were you in contact with one or a few sticky notes. Although in COVID times, we don't stick sticky notes to walls anymore, but on uh, murals or Miro dashboards. Uh, but you, I'm sure you are familiar with the sticky notes. Now, 3M is not just the company of sticky notes. 3M has 55,000 different products in its um, in its inventory. 55,000 different products that are created by 3M. And in 2017, five billion of the company's revenue was generated by products that did not exist five years before. So imagine this: five billion is close to 40% out of the 12 to 13 billion euro, uh, dollars of revenue for the company. Close to 40% of the revenue of the company came from products that didn't exist five years ago. So every five years, this company has to revamp uh, between 35 and, and 4, 45% of its total product portfolio. That does not only, and that percentage is increasing and the time is decreasing. And the volume of the share of products that are being developed that are online is vastly increasing in the total portfolio. Um, so the company has a major challenge, not only in, in managing its product development cycle, but also in managing the data flow that comes from that, what, but also the sales and the marketing efforts that they have. And most of that work is now digital and driven by APIs. And the speed that this company needs is increasingly dependent on the data flow in the organization. And that data flow is managed by APIs. So APIs <clears throat> are at the heart of innovation in every corporate. Now, there is a, there is a chicken and egg relationship between innovation and digital technology and especially API. So if we look at continuous innovation, if the market around companies is moving more, is moving ever faster, that also means that companies need to innovate faster, put new things to market. So if you look at this simple graph that I drew, in year one, <clears throat> if a company spends about 10, 15% of its efforts on innovation, those innovations which are innovations in year one, will become the scale up uh, part of the revenue of the company in year two, and it might actually be the new business as usual in, in year three. However, in year two, they spend an additional um, uh, amount of effort and time and money on new innovations, which for this innovation is year one, which become scale ups, which become new business as usual. But you get the picture, after three years, a substantial number of the business or a substantial part of the business will have been will have replaced the old business and this this waterfall no, it's not the best term to use uh, next to agile but this let's say this cascading of new ideas into scale ups into new business this cascading of innovation into scale up into new business that is becoming quickly becoming the new norm in organizations and that also means that the the amount of trial and error that we will do in our company and the and the the availability of apis and data exchanges that we'll have in the company needs to increase uh, dramatically and there are a few <clears throat> targets that we aim for in continuous innovation first and foremost it is a faster time to market creating a faster time to market we need to be able to release products faster than ever also we need to create far less waste in innovation spending. Now, you're probably not too aware of the innovation efforts of most large organizations, but um, it will come as no surprise that, let's say, between 70 and 80% of innovations never make it to the end line. They actually turn out not to be a success, not to be a big money maker. Either they hover around a break even or slightly above, but the real breakthroughs, there are less than 10% of the innovation spend. And they make up for the investment, but the, the innovations that don't succeed in the market also take up capacity and time from people. Uh, 
that are working on innovations that are not going to be a success. So basically what the aim is for continuous innovation as a process is not only to get products to market faster, but also to very early on identify that something is not going to be a success, pull the plug and make way for other ideas. So reduce the waste on innovation spending. And when we do that, we create employees that can work in an environment that is engaging, that is helping them and make it very tangible where their success is. And it helps to create an engaged audience and a committed um, uh, uh, group of employees in the company that would like to work for the company. <clears throat> so just a quick recap of the introduction. If you look at corporate performance, if you look at the market around them today, corporate organizations have a dramatic need to innovate and they need a consistent process to support that innovation to help them grow their business in the next few years and replacing their old business with the new ideas such as 3M on their product line or such as the newspaper trying to create relevant ads, not just ads and a personalized newspaper, not just any newspaper. And so in order for the companies to be able to work in that fast changing environment, they need a process that will help them to create faster time to market less waste in innovation spending, and that will create a nice engaging environment for their employees to work in. And actually, I'm not the only person saying that. There was research by C on CEOs, and this research was done by Deloitte, and, and the, the, the uh, CEOs of the company said, 64% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 company said that innovation is as important as operational effectiveness. So efficiency is as, as important as uh, creating new innovations. Being effective in what we do today is as important as being effective tomorrow or creating opportunities for tomorrow. And so this continuous innovation is, is quickly becoming a reliable process to capture innovative ideas, making sure that we find out whatever we might be working on, assess their feasibility and value for the organization as fast as possible, and then align business to adopt the innovation as quickly as possible, <clears throat> make sure that they become part of the new business as usual. And then on a level up, manage the portfolio of all of these innovations because we don't do one or two or occasionally or, or uh, in an ad hoc fashion, but we're m actively managing a portfolio of new innovations and we want to align the, that portfolio to business strategy. And hey, you know, if the CEO says it, it should be true, right? Well, actually it is. And the CEOs <clears throat> that run the companies, the, the CEOs that run the companies that do think that innovation is really important, we actually see them improve their, um, their business outcomes over the companies that do not spend that much time and effort on innovation. And yes, it's, it's a little bit tacky, but companies like Apple and Google and Amazon are doing you know, they're outpacing the rest of the market because of their focus on innovation. But they're, I don't think they are the benchmark for most other organizations. I think the benchmark is your competitors in your own field um, that, were, that are outdoing you because they spend more time and attention on innovation and they're quickest on the ball whenever something new or new opportunities arise in the market. So the, those CEOs, that the 64%, that I discussed here are also the CEOs of the most successful companies in the peer group that they were involved in. And I guess that means that they're right. Well, they have identified three key factors, three success factors for innovation. 57% uh, of those CEOs said, well, it, it, the most important thing is having the right culture to foster and support innovation. So it, the innovation is a cultural thing. It's not a technology thing. It is about having a safe environment. Uh, to innovate. It's about supporting uh, and budgeting innovation. It's about creating no process bottlenecks, but allowing the teams to get fast results, etc. 44% of, of, the, of the CEOs said uh, there is a, a need for strong visionary business leadership. So they they sort of place the importance at themselves and say, okay, we are, we are very important as, uh, to create the vision for uh, the business so that people know where to in innovate to. And 37% of all the CEOs 
said that the third reason is willingness to challenge norms and take risks. So do be different in the organization that we are today. And don't stick to the rules, break them every now and then and make sure something good comes out of it. Um, and by that, they mean that employees are encouraged to take ownership, that anyone can start innovation, that risk and failures are embraced, and that it goes beyond fuck up Friday for developers. That is real risk and failure in the organization to have it learning uh, from what you did wrong and then retrying again rather than uh, avoid risk and, and try to stay where you are. <clears throat> now, in my experience of managing corporate innovation in a technology environment, APIs are absolutely pivotal for some of these roles, for some of these uh, success factors. So when I color them red and I said, and if, if we take out all the business baloney, where are the APIs in all this? Well, the APIs are actually in creating a safe environment to innovate for innovators in management. Safe environment doesn't only mean that managers will not fire employees for doing something in innovation or wasting their time on something that's not business as usual, but also by creating a business technology structure and an architecture that will make it safe for us to experiment. And APIs play a vital role in that. APIs definitely play a role in generating fast results and, and taking out process bottlenecks. If we have APIs that were very quickly to align, that, were very, that can very quickly align, uh, or sorry, allow data to be disclosed to particular new uh, types of software functions, uh, then that will create no process bottlenecks. We don't have to go for agreement for everything but we can just use this piece of technology that will get us what we want to try out new things. That would be really good. And it creates a transparent process. So where can I get the data that I want to try out and experiment? Where can I find uh, access to systems that I need without overhauling our IT backlog? Uh, APIs will definitely provide an answer to those kind of questions. And open access to knowledge and experience means that through APIs, we can get connected to other parts of the business or even third parties, as we will see in a later stage. Now, jumping to the right side of the screen, you know, the willingness to challenge norms and take risks, APIs definitely uh, allow employees throughout the organization to take ownership of an innovation uh, and to start new innovative ideas without all the hassle and bustle of being completely up to date with the latest technology and then requesting it through all sorts of change management initiatives. You know, if we could enable APIs and, and disclose them to employees in the organizations to very quickly give people access to systems and data, we could very well encourage them to start new innovations and try things out. And I have a few examples of that later on. And that means if the availability is there, what happens is that we trigger people's interests and people's creativity. Because when they see what is possible in, in getting information out of systems that, they, that were undisclosed before, it will spark the creativity of people and make sure that they start off with innovation. And it's not so much that APIs are uh, getting us to you know, embrace risk and failure, but we can definitely, through the right use of APIs, we can control risk and failure, which makes it easier for us to embrace them. So managers in particular used to be very weary or are sometimes very weary of innovation because they cannot control the side effects of launching innovative stuff or opening up data for particular uses that they haven't audited before. Uh, and even in early stage innovation, in experiments, we see is that senior leaders are reluctant to give the green light for a particular experience because they do not know what will happen to the company data. They do not know how system landscapes will respond. But by the effective use of APIs, we can actually create a controlled environment in which this, uh, this innovation can take place. And that fosters the can-do mentality that is so important. So on the left side, we have the, the right culture to foster and support innovation by allowing fast results and transparency in a safe environment. On the right side, actually, we have the same thing, encouraging people to start working on it, allowing and enabling people to do that very quickly, do it in a controlled fashion. 
Um, and in the middle square, the, the strong visionary business leadership in the last point, actually it says leadership backs its vision by providing adequate financial and operational resources. And what I see increasingly, fortunately in, in large corporate environments is that the running organization is separated from the innovation organization by supplying operational resources as a default version for innovation. For instance, through open data uh, access, through uh, controlled APIs that do not adhere to the same rules and regulations that the operational APIs uh, adhere to, but they are specifically designed to support and foster innovative ideas. Um, so we put the ideas for the continuous innovation a need in a particular framework that will allow people to innovate very quickly and very effectively uh, in corporate organizations. And this model is very quickly catching on in corporates throughout the world. Um, and even though it's not directly relevant for the API uh, connotation here, uh, I'm going to run it through you because I want you to understand what the process is that innovation uh, goes through in organizations. Um, so that you can understand where APIs fit in and where APIs actually enable and facilitate this process. So this blueprint framework, this, this blueprint process model does not require a separate innovation department. It does not require any additional roles or functions in the organization. No, you, you don't need to hire anyone to do this, but it is if existing people in the company adhere to the roles and the rituals that we have in this framework, actually innovation starts to speed up very quickly. If you, if you think that you've seen this before in the scaled agile framework, you're right. This was based uh, on the best practices from scaled agile framework. And it was built as a side uh, process to the uh, connecting directly to the scaled agile framework. So there is a resemblance there. But, and also this material was built, this process was built based on uh, the most prominent innovation literature around. So Eric Ries's Lean Startup, Alex Osterwalder's Business Model Canvas, Ash Moria's Lean Canvas, uh, Value Proposition Design, and, and, uh, and, and these practices. Um, so this is basically built on the best of the best uh, available material in the world to create a generic process. And, and like I said, many, many corporates are picking up on this uh, and are starting to work in this fashion. So basically the process model is split up into three distinct layers. And the, at the bottom layer, let's start there. When, an, when somebody in the company we call the innovator has a bright idea, uh, we would ask them to validate that, that idea very quickly using things like the business model canvas or the lean canvas. So we we try to es establish on paper and in theory and very quickly in a few days, what is, what is the potential of this particular innovation? And when we see that it has theoretical potential, we want to launch this innovation in uh, something called a switch, which is a six week innovation challenge. It's basically an agile sprint, but longer because we don't just want to develop software in two weeks. We want to develop a product, which is probably digital, but not necessarily. I've seen people build hardware in, in a, let's say two to three weeks, then run practical tests with real customers for about two weeks, and then take the last week of the six weeks to learn and to sit and evaluate what have we seen, what data that we collect, how do we learn from this? And basically what happens is that in a validation phase, we build a business model and a strategy for our innovation that is loaded with assumptions. You know, we believe that we can build the technology. We believe that customers will like it. We believe that customers are willing to pay for it. We believe that you know, we can get data from a particular system. We believe that we can connect to a third party. All of these assumptions are then ranked by order of impact on the, on the success of the idea. And the biggest fail factor that we have, the one thing that we need to test, because if that one doesn't work, then everything else will fail, that, that idea, that hypothesis, we put in the first switch. So if that means we, can, we believe that we can connect two systems and, 
and add the data from those systems to a third set and then run an algorithm that will give us the right answer to a question, we will then go and build that construct in two to three weeks. And then we'll try it out for two weeks and then we'll assess our learnings in the first, uh, in, sorry, in the last week. And then we'll pitch that to management saying, well, the, the innovation promise, the vision for the future is that we can save tremendous amount of cost by, um, uh, by adding this data from various systems and, and running an algorithm and, and then working with the answer. And we've just proven that we can do it. So now the next biggest fail factor is that customers are actually comfortable in using this. So in the next switch, we might spend two to three weeks to build an inter, you know, a front end to customers, uh, and then spend two or three weeks uh, getting customers to use that front end and giving us feedback in the last week of learning. And then again, we can pitch and we can say, well, the big vision is that we can save all this cost by adding data from various systems and running an algorithm. And we've in the first switch we built that. In the second one, we got users to use it through the user interface that we provided, and we've learned that uh, they like 60%, but they want an additional 40%. So in the, in the third switch, we're going to build the other 40% and see how they like that. And then gradually, you know, switch by switch, usually after three to four switches, we have found a product that has a particular market potential, and then we need to scale it up and make sure that we grow it and make sure also in six week iterations that we can grow the group of users or we can add more data or we can add you know more uh, dynamics in the algorithm and we can grow the usage and the importance of this until finally in the end we can embed or we have embedded this particular way of working this algorithm in our technology architecture in our existing competencies in our processes and partnerships or which happens most often, or because we have adopted our architecture to fit the new algorithm, and we have trained people to use this new way of working, and we have adjusted our processes for this automated street that we had, and we have solidified our partnerships. So on the first level, on the lowest level, we go from an idea through short-cycled iterative development and structured scale-up, we go into growth. Now, any corporate at any given point in time has not just one or two or a few of those ideas, most corporates have between 50 and 150 of, of those ideas concurrent. Um, depending on the size of the corporation, at least anything that has 1,000 to 1,500 people in size of business unit might probably have between 10 and 20 of those ideas running. So that is a portfolio of innovations and they need to be prioritized and funded and guided and if you do that on a managed portfolio, you can actually link your innovation to your strategic drivers and your value goals, so your, your strategic ambitions of the company. So through the use of this model, where we have a small team of people developing these innovative solutions and getting them sign off by the senior management of the company, um, who use the company's strategy as a benchmark, we can actually create a very fast flow of innovation from idea to realization. Now, fast is actually the key word here because what is ultimately important is that you create speed in this. We found by doing hundreds of switches uh, with companies around the globe that as soon as you have finished the switch, you need agreement for the next six weeks and you continue your work. So you have stage gates that take no time. They literally take 15 minutes, seven minutes of pitch, eight minutes of questions and, and okaying. And then they're off for the next six weeks. And then 15 minutes of presentation and they're off to the next six weeks. It may sound amazing to some of you when you look at the development cycles in your organization, but we know from experience that we can do this. We can get senior management to sign off on capacity and resources every six weeks for the next wave of innovation. The one blocking factor is that keeps a lot of these, especially digital innovations from progressing fast is technology. So let's assume that they're in a switch is a, techno a technological idea or just the, just the, the, the algorithm uh, that I mentioned. Um, 
usually getting the data from various systems or combining data from various systems into a, into a third uh, software application, into a third party software application, that is the bottleneck because we get all sorts of security problems, synchronization errors, maybe the backlog is already full for other work that, that is being done. Uh, maybe what we're asking does not quite fit into the definition of our of our data gates, so our APIs are not pre-programmed to do that. And basically, our running organization that was fully aimed at servicing the organizational that is already in place is not ready to accommodate for all of that innovation. And that's exactly where innovation APIs come into play. So I'm going to give you a few real life examples. This example is from last summer, and it's very similar to what we've, uh, to what I've said uh, to the, the the example that I've used before. So take an insurance company; it's one of the largest insurance companies in Europe that had a project goal to uh, create automatic premium adjustments for car insurance, and not so much for individual car insurance, but for fleet managed car insurance. So companies that run a hundred plus vehicles and the th the theory was the assumption was that if we could collect data from various black boxes in cars but also from previous behavior from customers with similar um, uh, with with similar uh, attributes we could actually improve the prediction of customer behavior which would give us a good understanding of the damage load that they would try to get insured over the course of a year. And we could adjust the premium for those companies that we would expect to have a lower load. So loyalty of insurance companies is basically based on how low you can keep the premium. So if you can keep the premium lower, you can increase the loyalty of some customers that are actually doing a good job. And that is the reward for not being damaged or not making damage to your, to your fleet. And the, the premise was that we could create this automatic premium adjustment by adding data from multiple systems. So we needed to add data from three systems into a single risk calculation. We would want to add two additional fields in the ERP system and a slight algorithm change. The problem was, though, that the two ERP systems that were being used were both in migration. They were actually migrating from one old system that was partly operational into a new system that was partly operational, and it was going to last for another two years. So there was no way that we could get time on the backlog of those teams in order to get the fields added to the ERP system, uh, nor that we could get access to the default API. So what we did was actually pretty smart. It was, we duplicated an existing API um, uh, and we created a third provisionary database in which we could mimic the data coming from the two fields. Then we could tweak the copied API that we had to the needs that we had. And the first thing we did was take out all of the security measures because we were only going to use this for our internal usage. It was never going to be in an operational system. We rerouted some of the data from the operational into API into the innovation API. And then we started running some tests. Because basically, the only thing that we needed to prove was that by adding the data from the systems and adding the data from the two additional fields, we could actually improve the algorithm and we could make it work. And so in a simulated environment, uh, we did that. And we had a proof of concept running in six weeks. We had proof of value in 12 weeks at the total cost of less than 15,000 euros. Now, what that proved is that we could uh, potentially save hundreds of thousands of euros in the months to come, given that we had, I'm not quite sure exactly, let's say two to, two to three sprints from one of the development teams in the ERP program to create the additional fields and maybe get some sprint work done on the, uh, on the existing API layer. Um, and that information, the proof of the value that we had delivered in three months was actually enough to, to green light and prioritize this work done on the ERP systems and the API layer against the existing ERP backlog and get the work fixed as well. So by very quickly using a very, honest to God, a very shaky API, we could prove the value of the work and then 
for this particular team, that API sort of turned into um, a thing in itself, and it was called the Innovation API. And it allowed other teams as well to very quickly get data from the ERP systems to prove their point and run their business. It could never grow into a serious, full-blown operational API, but it was, let's say, the toy to play with for the innovation teams. So the Innovation API is a toolkit for innovation. And it's, it's an API that is readily available to all. It provides user, it, it, it achieves usability over performance. It's not something that is fully tweaked for high performance uh, uh, issues on the API. So usability is more important than, than performance. We need to be able to rapidly adjust, rapidly extract, rapidly connect. Um, and it should be ready to deploy at any time. And that innovation API does not just come with the software associated to it. It comes with a few people that can actually very quickly get it to work for a particular innovation team. It is internal only. It needs minimum compliancy and minimum security. It needs great governance on where it's used, though, because uh, some people will try and use this API as a way to circumvent all sorts of compliance and security problems that they might experience in bringing stuff live. So we know from experience that it takes governance but the technology itself can be very simple. What we want is something ready to build in two weeks, something ready, ready to measure across many data points, something to connect to many systems, and something that can be readily tweaked at any given time. Now, the idea initially originated in that publisher. Remember the publisher example that I had uh, all the way in the beginning? That publisher said, we want a data landscape where data is completely disconnected from any of the uh, systems, operational systems that we have. We don't want any databases inside the front end applications. We want a single data landscape that is to totally API driven. And only that will give us the relevant ads that we have in the fully personalized services. So they ran a few innovation setups through innovation APIs that were step-up subscriptions that you could you know, gradually increase your subscription level. The personalized newspaper that we already discussed and compelling ads. And eventually it allowed them to offer a service that is called Create Your Own Magazine, where you could collect content from various publications that they had into a single magazine that was tailor-made for you. Now, the requirements for innovation APIs, as we're running out of time, I would like to close off. The, the requirements for innovations APIs for you when you start thinking about these are, are fairly simple. First and foremost, take an outside in perspective. Try not to think from the data existing in your company or the technology that's available, but try to think of what people would want, what innovators would want how you can get them to get their hands on data as quickly as possible without the need for GDPR or compliance or secure, security. Make sure that they are highly open, extremely forgiving, but very low on volume. There is no performance requirement. The tests that you're going to run are really, really small. Also, you, it, I kind of like the idea of having a physical environment that will limit you when you start scaling up. So if you build your APIs for low performance, then you'll as soon as you start scaling up, you'll automatically be triggered that you cannot scale an innovation API into production. Design it to limit the blast radius. If something goes wrong, it shouldn't affect any of the systems surrounding it. So probably they're one-way only uh, data streams. If they are, Uploads to systems or uploads to other databases, make sure that you limit the blast radius for whatever happens. Um, and keep in mind, they're not production ready. They don't need to be production ready. And explain to the environment around you that innovation APIs that serve a different function from other APIs. They are, they are meant to you know, play around with and get data very quickly to the teams that need to make speed. The most important thing that you have is APIs that support the build, measure, learn cycle until the scale up in live and production. So make sure that you start servicing this part 
where we do the quick cycles, the six week innovation challenges, the quick build, measure, learn sprints, where we try out new stuff. The minute we start scaling up, you might want to move the technology that you've built on these innovation APIs and transfer them to real APIs. Two main reasons for that. One is the real APIs are the only ones that are secure, that are mandated, that are you know have high performance, but also because you need to transfer and grow your business into that, um, in that more governed and more uh, professional and rigorous environment. And that will lead you to architecture considerations, uh, implementations within different processes. So the, the physical move from one API layer to the next, from an innovation API into a fully operational production, la production ready API also means that you come across, automatically come across these questions at the time they are relevant for the innovation. Um, and uh, greatly of, of great help is, is what I call the API hub. It is a publication where people in your organization will understand what kind of APIs are available, where they can get their data, what they can get it for, and how fast they can get access to it. It will allow you to very quickly identify which APIs are most relevant for the people in an innovation role um, and where you could create those innovation APIs. Um, and then, but show them what other data you have and where else people could, could work with data in your company. And last but not least, you as a team of API managers and API builders should get ready to support innovators without losing time. Innovators in your organization have great ideas. They are fantastic people, but they don't have time. They need to move fast in order to stay relevant. And that means that you, if you help them through APIs, you need to get ready to support them on delivering that innovation value in your company. Um, my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. If you would like to join the COIN or the Continuous Innovation LinkedIn group, scan the QR code and feel free to email us whenever you have a question on info at continuousinnovation.net. I have a, a few more minutes to answer some of the questions on the chat, if you want. No, all right. So I'm not getting any direct questions, and when I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, thank you very much for those who like my presentation. I appreciate the compliment. Um, and if you want to know more, you can visit continuousinnovation.net or join the LinkedIn group. Uh, it was a pleasure, although I couldn't hear you or see you, but it was a pleasure doing it for you. And uh, I um, hope to uh, meet you in the future. Thank you.